So hello everyone and welcome to this summary. Uh, in this summary I'm going to present uh, Zavon, Zavon's paper published in 2016. Sorry, I just need to make some adjustments here. I've got two screens. One uh, is my laptop right in front of me and one is uh, my monitor right over there. So I'm going to read it from my laptop and walk you through. So, um, first things first, uh, this paper is basically uh, about uh, mental simulations and, and, and uh, word processing and language processing in some sense. What happens is uh, that there are some terminologies which might not be necessarily um, you know, accessible to some of the readers of the paper. So I would suggest that you guys take a look at this paper, which has been published in Cortex. Uh, it will, the, the authors talk about a, a theory called, actually a hypothesis called cognitive embodiment hypothesis, the, the hypothesis that cognitive processes of all kinds are rooted in perception and action. Perception has to do with sensory uh, information and action has to do with motor. So s this uh, article is, is a very good review uh, which will tell you what sensory motor uh, information processing is and of course then the information that you can obtain from this paper can help you a lot to understand Zvan's paper better. But if you do not find time to do so, don't worry, I'll try to simplify uh, this paper as much as I can. So, um, Zavon's paper published in 2016 basically tries to integrate two main concepts. One concept is situation models and the other one is mental simulations. Situation models are represented and discussed in theoretical frameworks uh, in, for example, the construction integration model of comprehension and mental simulations are discussed in perceptual uh, symbol theory, uh, which I will go through quickly uh, with you here. So, this paper uh, basically examines these things. First, the role of symbolic and sensory motor representations in discourse comprehension and how symbolic and sensory motor representations constrain each other and also the role of abstract ideas in discourse comprehension. Uh, he also focuses uh, especially towards the uh, end, that's the conclusion of the, of the paper. He highlights the role of cataphoric and anaphoric integration of the text. So I'll try to give some examples to make these concepts more accessible to you if you're not familiar with them. First of all, what is a situation model? Um, the term situation model actually refers to the mental representation that's generated uh, after we read a text or we listen to a text. So whatever I'm, I'm discussing here, actually what Zvon is discussing and I'm reviewing for you, is applicable to both listening comprehension and reading or discourse comprehension. Um, perhaps one of the first papers uh, were works that discussed situation models in length was the work published by Van Dyke and Kinch, or Kinch and Van Dyke, and later in, uh, you know, in, in a fully developed form in Kinch Construction Integration Model. So the idea is, when it, when, whenever you are engaged in a text, with a text, you're reading a text or you're listening to a text, uh, what is happening is that you are uh, doing some bottom-up processing, that's decoding the, the words and the sentences as they are, and also you're adding a lot of world knowledge to it, to you're making inferences which are not, which are otherwise not uh, explicitly stated in the text. Why do we do so? We, we add information, uh, we add some world knowledge to the, to the text that we hear or listen to because we want to uh, develop this, what we call the situation model. If we are not able to do so, uh, in other words, if we are not able to add knowledge uh, or experience or information that we have to what we read, actually a situation model will not be uh, generated. And a situation model is basically uh, evolving. That is, in this part of the text or in this part of the listening extract, 
whatever you generate is the local representation of the text and that local representation is going to uh, evolve gradually as you obtain more and more information in the text um, that's actually what I wanted to elaborate in this slide and I want to move on to the event inde indexing model it's a, a, a model which also uh, recognizes and leverages the concept of the situation model and if event indexing model of course ex expands on it expands on the situation model and proposes that uh, the situation models have got five major dimensions or five major elements time, space, entity, causation and motivation. Suppose that you are reading a text or you are listening to a text uh, about about a bank robbery. If the text gives you enough information about the time of the robbery, about the space where it happened, um, entity for example the robber causation what went the person to rob a bank and uh, and also the motivation of that person and things like that and if sentences are written or are said in a in a way that time and space and all all of those dimensions are are logically connected to each other then the event indexing model would predict that you would represent that event in your mind uh, in a much more in a much easier way than if time and space and other dimensions are not very well connected in the text so uh, and as Zvan puts it as each incoming clause as statement is processed an event representation is formed and it's integrated with the event representations currently in the working memory based uh, on its overlap with these representations on each of the five dimensions. So, like I said, if the newly, pr the currently, the, the information that's currently being processed has something to do with the information that you have already processed, we have already read or listened to, uh, the event representation which will be much more clear and uh, coherent. Now, what are the implications of this model? which was proposed by Zvan himself and some of his colleagues. Well, um, the first thing that we should remember, and I think it could have some applications in our classroom teachings as well, all of these five dimensions are equally weighted. That is, if the text is not clear on, for example, its time dimension or its space dimension, uh, chances are that uh, the student who's engaged with the text might not really understand the text pretty well and they are the so as a result the effects are additive the higher in other words the higher the clarity in all those dimensions the higher uh, the clarity of the entire text and as a result the better uh, the and the, the more clear the uh, generated situation model so the more situational overlap the current event has with the contents of working memory and by content of working memory we mean the text we that we have already read the part of the text that we have read like three sentences I've already read three sentences that's the content of my working memory plus the information and the world knowledge that I've added to it so the more situation overlap between that and the current sentence I'm reading or the current clause, the easier it should be to process the clause as uh, describing that event and the stronger the connections between the current event and the events in the working memory which I just uh, discussed. Uh, it's interesting to know that as Zovan also mentions in the paper, uh, this theory has been extended to the domain of film understanding. It's quite exciting to me because uh, the if this theory can um, usefully and coherently predict what happens in during film understanding and linguistic information understanding and reading and listening, uh, I think that's a theory which is very desirable because uh, it's quite uh, reductionist in the sense that we kill one bird with two stone or <laughs> we kill two birds with one stone, um, which means. Uh, 
we do not need to have separate theories for linguistic understanding, a separate theory for film understanding, and a separate theory for um, something else. Uh, that's something I like about the theory. Now, as I said, actually, Zavon mentions that uh, the, the aim of his uh, paper is to create a bridge or a link between situation models, which I have already discussed, uh, uh, and I've provided two examples of the two theories, and also the mental simulations, which uh, are discussed in, in at some length in perceptual symbol theory uh, by Barcelo. Uh, what does this theory say? So let's see how this uh, theory works and how this uh, kind of bridge is generated by uh, Zwan. On the left hand side here you see uh, there is an amodal symbol systems uh, is pretty much like what we have seen previously in uh, the situation models as generated in uh, as hypothesized in construction integration model uh, in other words those models are based on propositional representation of whatever uh, words that we read and whatever object that we see around us so a chair like this which has got uh, a back and a seat and legs is actually represented here uh, as a model uh, symbols uh, it has got a list of features and uh, so on and so forth and this sort of representation is the same for memory for language and for thought processes on the other hand what perceptual sim uh, symbol theory actually mentions is that um, um, well, the words or the objects that we see around us are represented as images rather than as lists or, you know, a modal symbols. So this image is basically what we refer to as perceptual symbols. This idea here is the underlying the underlying concept or the underlying theory in perceptual uh, symbol theory. And this idea here is something that that has that was already around before. Uh, the perceptual symbol theory was proposed. So what, like I said, what Zwan is, is trying to do is to create a bridge between these two theories, which are otherwise not, probably not very uh, closely linked. In his own words, one hypothesis is that linguistic and perceptual processes mutually constrain each other. And what does that mean? I have uh, an example here to, to provide. Um, Zwan gives us some evidence from neuroscience research. He says recent neuroimaging experiments have shown that the degree to which sensory motor information is activated during sentence comprehension uh, depends on the linguistic context. What does that mean? I am going to elaborate on it uh, using a sentence here. I cut into the line versus I cut my finger. When you read the first word cut, I cut um, and the second word cut the sort of sensory motor information that's evoked in your mind is very different the second one probably evokes some feeling of discomfort depending on how deep the cut is and perhaps some feeling of pain depending on if you have experienced this uh, event before yourself and how severe it was and you know other factors so the word cut itself generates some sensory motor information which is otherwise not in the text and on the other hand uh, those sensory motor information that the uh, the feeling that you get the feeling of discomfort and uh, other things can also uh, evoke other words like partially excite or partially activate other words in your mind something that is relevant to cut for example the word knife might be activated in your mind the stitches even doctors and um, nurses and hospital or clinic all of those things might get activated so there is an interplay between the word cut itself sensory motor information and other words or concepts that are closely uh, related to those feelings and emotions that's basically what Zwan is talking about uh, in this paper so 
uh, as he puts it, as longer stretches of text are read, more and more sensory motor representations will uh, become activated. Yes, as you get more information about how deep the cut was and what did the person do after that and so on and so forth, more and more sensory motor information become activated. If it's not severe, then you probably feel a bit relieved, a little bit, uh, if you're really engaged with the text, of course. And if it's severe, you might not feel very comfortable and may say, oh my god, the person is in pain and so on. Uh, which will in turn activate associated lexical representations and those lexical representations, like I said, knives and doctors and stuff, will activate further feelings and emotions, sensory motor information, to put it uh, in more technical jargon. Now, the gist is the flow of activation between symbolic, that's words, uh, and sensory motor representation, that's the feelings which I talked about, is likely bidirectional, right? It makes a lot of sense. Already uh, bidirectional, as those guys, Zavan and Madden, have already proposed, and the two layers of uh, representation uh, mutually constrain each other to produce fluency in uh, the comprehension process, which makes perfect sense because once uh, the word cut uh, generates um, closely linked uh, linguistic symbols, like knife and stuff, uh, you, you do not just very randomly um, you know, activate all sort of words and information. You just activate anything which is related to that context, to that specific word in that specific context. So I cut my finger, activates certain sensory motor uh, information and those sensory, uh, the sensory motor information activates certain words which the word cut in I cut into the line does not activate. It activates a, a very different thing. If, for example, we get um, we receive more information about where this line was, where was it, for example, in front of a McDonald's outlet, or was it in a, in a bank, or was it uh, I don't know in an office, etc. The whole sensory information which is activated, and as a result, the connected words, the linked words which also will be activated, will be quite different. So, in conclusion, uh, and one more, one, more, one more thing before I draw the conclusion. Now, how about abstract words? Uh, Zwan also provides evidence that if abstract words, such as justice, are contextualized, pretty much like the word cut in that context, sufficiently, their activation process is more or less like concrete words, which I have mentioned. So, in a, in a, he provides more evidence, actually, and uh, he argues more about it. So, in a, in a sense, uh, the problem of what happens to abstract words is kind of resolved here. In conclusion, symbolic representations and the associations between them interact with sensory motor representations to achieve fluent discourse comprehension which is basically uh, the main message that uh, Zvon has uh, put forth. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, you uh, find it useful in your research. Actually, it was meant for my uh, students in the Master Program of Applied Linguistics. Um, I didn't prepare much, so I just uh, turned on my computer, I made the slides, and I went through the slides. I really hope that you find it useful. Thank you very much for your attention.